So let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and if you know anything about Antioch over the last two years, you know that this is the passage that we continually come back to. It's the passage that uh, clarified and galvanized the vision that we believe God has given us, this vision of the reconciliation of all things. And so particularly verses 15 through 20 of Colossians chapter 1 um, are kind of a grounding, uh, it's a grounding biblical text for us. It is the one that God has spoken to us and over us and commissioned us out of to help us discover our identity in him and our mission in the world. And so we're going to come back to it um, this morning. And I want to come back to this passage through the lens of the paradigm of sacred versus secular. Sacred versus secular. And so for those of us who grew up um, in the evangelical world, um, we probably have memories of hearing uh, this, this idea presented to us. That there's kind of those things in life and those things in the world that we would call sacred. Those things that are spiritual. Those things that are undeniably Christian and pleasing to God. And then there's those things in the world that we might call secular. Those things that are worldly. Those things that are not of God or non-Christian. And so we probably, if you were evangelical like me, we didn't use the word sacred. We used the word Christian versus secular. And so for me, this was um, particularly um, emphasized as a pastor's kid. And I remember growing up, and there were all these kind of unwritten rules. Like, my friends could watch, like, He-Man, and I learned Bible stories on flannel graph, right? (laughs) Um, there's the secular, and then there was the sacred. My friends listened to secular music, non-Christian music, and I listened to Christian music. In fact, there were even these charts at the Christian bookstore that's like, if you like Nirvana, you should try DC Talk, all right? <laughs> and if you know anything about music, already you're offended by that comparison. Um, and then, you know, I don't even know... Uh, my friends would dress up like monsters and zombies for Halloween. And we, at our Christian school I went to, didn't do Halloween. We did a harvest party, right? Uh, let me pause just for a moment. Christmas, Easter, Halloween, of those three holidays, only one has Christian roots. It's not Christmas or Easter. Halloween is actually the one truly Christian holiday of the three. Side note, think about that, Google it, whatever. We had a harvest party where we dressed up like Bible characters, right? (laughs) And as like an eight-year-old dude, if you're choosing Bible characters, you can only be Samson so many years in a row. (laughs) Um, So... Uh, you begin to look at the world around you as the, the Christian stuff and the secular stuff. Now, I'm not talking about the sinful stuff. I'm not talking about the stuff that, that God explicitly uh, commands Christians to avoid and to, not, and to not fall into. I'm simply talking about those elements of human life and of culture. And some of them, some jobs and some kinds of music and some kinds of movies and some kinds of literature or whatever, we kind of want to hold up as sacred, and then we have uh, that which is secular, secular jobs, secular friends, secular (laughs) media, some of it's sexual as well, Uh, (laughs) media and art. And so um, the question is, I don't know, is is anybody resonating with this? Okay. Uh, We've got some group therapy to do probably, but... um, where did this idea come from? And it's, it's really rooted in this idea of dualism. That um, starting really with, with Plato, that there's this physical world and then there's this spiritual world. And the physical world is the world that's in front of us, the world that we can see, the world that we can touch, the earthly uh, physical reality. And then there's this spiritual reality, this heavenly reality, and it's the stuff that we can't see. Now, so far, we're consistent with what I'd say is a biblical worldview. And there's many places in the scriptures where we talk about this kind of 
spiritual dimension that coexists with the physical reality that we can't always see, right? And we don't always know what God is up to or what's happening in the spiritual world. And so that's not the dualistic problem. The dualistic problem is when um, kind of a, a, from a Platonistic teaching, we would go to this place where <clears throat> not just um, the physical world, but even the person is made up of both kind of a physical meat, flesh reality, and then there's this spiritual invisible reality. Now, still not a problem. We know that there are multiple parts to the person and God has made us that way. But the problem shows up when the physical is deemed bad and the spiritual is deemed good, right? That the earthly, fleshly, physical parts of myself and of the world are the things that aren't really good and godly and glorifying to him and Christian. And then the spiritual, invisible, kind of Christian world out there is the thing that we should really um, focus on. And so that's when dualism becomes problematic in, in terms of being consistent with the worldview that the Bible teaches. And essentially it has implications, if you take it seriously, that our goal as humans should therefore be to be as spiritual as possible. That we need to separate ourselves as much as possible from the things of this world, from the physical world, uh, if you will. And early on, at the time of Paul's writing to the Colossian, Colossians, there's this religious sect known as the Gnostics that had really bought into this uh, worldview and belief that the goal is to pull away from the physical world and instead to be as spiritually focused and spiritually minded as possible. And the reality that we have a physical self is um, an unfortunate reality. And so this philosophy has had a significant impact on the development of Christian theology uh, throughout the years. Even if you go all the way back to a good guy like John Wesley, um, when you read some of the um, theological vision he had, or for example, from his theology of perfection, John Wesley says, Beware of desiring anything but God. Admit no desire of pleasing food for any pleasure or, or, or any pleasure of sense. No desire of pleasing the eye or the imagination by anything grand or new or beautiful. No desire of happiness in any creature. That sounds like fun, right? <laughs> Um, you see this dualistic thinking that most of us don't ever come out and say this, but um, it is something that a lot of us have picked up over the years in our faith formation, that we should focus on uh, the spiritual reality and try to avoid and move away from the physical reality, both as it relates to our own selves and the world um, that we live in. Several years ago, uh, before we moved over here in Corvallis, uh, I had a neighbor by the name of Alan who um, he was my next door neighbor and had a PhD in environmental ethics. He taught in the philosophy department at Oregon State and uh, we became really good friends and had interesting conversations on a regular basis um, about all kinds of things in, in life, but specifically he was interested in how my worldview as a follower of Jesus shaped the way that I saw and interacted with the environment and um, had intriguing discussions. And at the end, he was... Um, <clears throat> he had this idea that there are two kinds of Christians in the world, and one of those kinds of Christians he really liked, and the other kind he didn't like, through the lens of environmental ethics. And in his words, he said that there's creation Christians and there's salvation Christians. He's like, creation Christians I like, because they're the ones that acknowledge that the God that they worship is the God who created the world. And of course, if God created the world, then we want to care about the world that God has made. We want to love the world that the God who we love made. And so he goes, creation Christians I like. Salvation Christians, not so much. The ones that think that this world is bad and is going to hell in a handbasket and the goal of salvation, the goal of the gospel is to get people away from earth and go away, go away to heaven. And um, so Alan and I talked about this multiple times, and in the end, I would have to reject, uh, not his observation, because I'm sure that was actually rooted in real experience, 
But <clears throat> this, these categories, that there's salvation Christians and there's creation Christians. Read through what Paul says here in Colossians chapter 1 and try to go, is he valuing the, the spiritual or the physical more? Does he care more about the eternal or about that which is in front of us? Um, we'll read it again. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things on in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Okay, so far, if we buy into that, we are creation Christians, are we not? That we hold to this belief that God created this world and said that it was good, and Jesus is the firstborn over all creation, and that's the Jesus that we follow. Then we move on, verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church, and he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We start by saying, yeah, we're creation Christians, but very quickly then the conversation shifts to what God has done in Christ to bring salvation to his creation. And so now if we hold to this whole gospel, we are both creation and salvation Christians. We don't choose one or the other, but the story is much bigger than either of those categories. Look at the repeated word in these, even these five verses. There's one word that gets used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. What is that word? Open book test. I'm, I'm just going to wait. Somebody can do this. There's one word that's repeated seven times that emphasizes the nature and the scope. All, oh, very good. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. You guys are killing me. All, firstborn over all creation. In him, all things were created. All things have been created. All things, all things, all things. So when you hold up this biblical vision of God as the creator of all things and the reconciler or redeemer of all things, and then go, how did we end up as dualistic people who have this category of the sacred and the secular, where some things matter to God and other things don't, where some things have the potential to be God-pleasing and God-glorifying and other things don't? I'm going to take the Bible over Plato. Now, on one hand, if we wanted to do a really, um, I would say, low level or even undeveloped application of this idea, it would be like, hey guys, it's cool if you want to listen to secular music, right? It's cool if you want to watch secular movies. It's cool if you want to drink secular beverages um, here in Bend. And Maybe that is the first thing that we, some of us need to hear of just going, those categories are not biblical or God-given. Um, but that's maybe just the very beginning of what I would want to say, not just to give license or permission to enjoy the things of this world. I think there's something so much more significant that's happening here. That this realization that Jesus is Lord of all, that the heavens and the earth all belong to him. The heavens, the spiritual, and the earth, the physical, they all belong to him. He delights in them all, and not only has he created them all, but he's redeeming and reconciling all things. This, tends to, this will change the way that we see God and see the world and see ourselves. And so start even with the thought of um, what you do for work. For many of us, we would have categories to think through that there's some jobs that Christians do that are really spiritual or sacred, and then there's some jobs that Christians do that are just kind of, yeah, it's just sort of a job. It's in the secular world, right? So the sacred jobs would be like me, right? Professional Christians. 
um, <clears throat> who teach the Bible and who lead churches, or maybe it's worship leaders or missionaries or evangelists or campus ministers or people that work for nonprofits doing justice and, and missions and that sort of thing. But we see those as kind of the sacred call um, that God has on some Christians' lives. But then for the rest of us, that are bankers and plumbers and Spanish teachers and graphic designers and massage therapists and butchers or whatever else. We're like, yeah, that's cool. You got to pay the bills, I guess. Um, so, you know, go do your job, but it's clearly not a sacred or a holy or a Christian calling. And I would say that this vision of Christ being Lord of all, the creator of all, and the redeemer of all of heaven and earth, it begins to destroy those categories. Now, I do believe that the work I do is uh, a calling from God. I don't see being a pastor as a career. It's a terrible career. If it's a calling, then what else are you going to do? Right? This is the thing that I really believe God has made me um, to do. And so I see what I do as a calling, but I don't see my calling as any more sacred or holy or Christian than yours as a contractor or as a full-time homemaker or whatever. Those categories go away when we catch the vision of this big, big gospel. And so... Um, I think when it comes to how we think about work and career and vocation, um, this gospel has something to say to it. I think even just in terms of relationships, friendships, community, um, I've spent a good chunk of my life with like my Christian friends and my non-Christian friends, right? And um, it depends on who you are, which one of those you would consider your real friends, but you kind of go back and forth between the worlds. Um, <clears throat> for some of us, it's uh, more of a prioritization, where even those that would say, I think the most important things in life are God first, uh, family second, work third, friends fourth, or, or something like that. That's a good order if we're going to have an order. But do you still see the dualistic um, wiring within that? That somehow, okay, I did my God first time, and now I'm able to tend to these other things of work and friends and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just convinced that to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus would change our categories, would change our lenses, would change the way that we see and interact with ourselves and with people and the rest of the world. Let me share with you a couple more poetic and beautiful summaries of what I'm trying to say. Elizabeth Barrett Browning says, Earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes and the rest sit around and pluck blackberries. The famous quote from Abraham Kuyper, There's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. There is no secular and sacred in God's ecology. All of it is for Jesus. And all of it, every part of life, not just Sundays, but all seven days, are an opportunity for us to walk in the presence and the beauty of who Christ is and what he's up to in his reconciling work. And so we start by saying that this sacred secular divide, we're just going to put it to the side. Now again, I, if you're trying to misunderstand me, please don't. <laughs> there is still a thing called sin, right? We're not saying, hey, everything's cool. There's, you know, that's not what we're saying. We're saying there's not a secular sacred. There still is a desecration that can happen. There still is taking the good things that God has made and using them for evil and corruption and oppression and harm to ourselves and to others. And so we don't celebrate that stuff. We put that stuff in the category of that which Christ is continuing to redeem. That is still part of the world that he loves and that he's made and that he's bringing about reconciliation in. 
And so um, for several years now, Antioch has rallied around this vision that comes from this passage, Paul's language, the reconciliation of all things, seven times in this one passage, all things, everything. And later on, when we get down further to verse 23, Paul says, this is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. What is the gospel? Well, it's the words that he just spoke before that. According to Paul, this gospel, the gospel, the good news about Jesus is that he is reconciling all things to himself. And so for us, we are committed to being people who are not only experiencing life as the recipients of this vision, but also actively engaging as participants in it. We are recipients of this gospel of reconciliation in the sense that God is wanting to reconcile us to himself and to ourselves and to one another. We benefit from this mission of reconciliation and it's this lifelong journey that God invites us into to become closer and closer to who he's created and called us to be and the life he's meant for us to live. But we are also then commissioned by God as agents or ambassadors of reconciliation in the world. That as we are reconciled to God and ourselves and one another within the church, that when we are sent into the world to do the ministry of reconciliation within our city and across the globe and with the rest of creation. And so um, this is what we have set our entire church up to be about, to pursue this vision and to chase after it with faith and with longing and with uh, uh, obedient hearts that are ready to say, King Jesus, King of heaven and earth, King of my heart, King of my spirit and my soul and my body, we want you to rule in your sovereignty, in your wisdom, in your truth and in your power, in us and among us and through us in this city and around the world. What Paul says here in verse uh, 20 is that somehow that um, what Christ accomplished for us on the cross, if we read verse 19 and 20, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This word peace is connected to this biblical theme of shalom, a word that's used 500 times throughout the scriptures, the shalom of God. And it's not peace, we know, just in the sense of absence of conflict, but it's peace that's actually a robust unity and harmony. It's things working together the way that they were meant to. And it's these multiple relationships with God and self and others and the rest of creation, the shalom that God desires for his people to experience. Cornelius planning a, uh, fr- phrases it this way. He says, in the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed, a state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be the way things ought to be. And so this is the vision that drives us as a church, that how is God wanting to shalom our lives? How is God wanting to bring about this peace and wholeness and flourishing within us? And secondly, how is God calling us to work for his shalom uh, in the world? And wherever that shows up, in our place of work, in our neighborhood, in our travel, in our relationships, in our leisure time, what does it look like to work for and to celebrate and to proclaim God's saving shalom over all things? And so Paul goes on to say that somehow here in verse 18, that even though Jesus is the one who creates and redeems and reconciles all things, central to the way God has chosen to work in the world and play out this story of redemption is this thing called the church. He is the head of the body, his church. 
He's the beginning and the first born among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. And so for whatever reason, God has chosen to impart to us what Pascal called the dignity of causality. That is, he's invited us into a partnering relationship where for whatever reason God chooses that most of his work in this world is going to happen through his body, the church. That we are to be his physical representation in his creation. We are to be the hands and the feet, the body of Jesus that is living a life of shalom and announcing a gospel of shalom as well. And so this vision is beautiful because it, when he's talking about church, he's not talking about a place that we go once a week. He's not talking about a service that we attend or a building that we show up, on, 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 up to on Sundays. When he talks about the church, he's talking about a people. He's talking about a family. He's talking about uh, individuals that are called to participate in this beautiful vision and mission of reconciliation wherever we find ourselves. And so I, I would think, about, again, back to this idea of work. And if we're getting rid of the idea that some jobs are more spiritual or sacred than others and saying that all work is beautiful and sacred and holy because Christ, who is sacred and holy, has called us to it. Then all of a sudden, for those of you that are in healthcare, those of you that are in education, those of you that are in business, those that are in media or the arts or entertainment, those of you that work in sports, those of you that work in the social sector, nonprofits, and yes, even those of us that work for the church, um, somehow all of this is an opportunity for God's redeeming, reconciling work to flow through his people into the world. I want to take a few minutes and share the story of Ernest Gordon. Um, if you saw the movie To End All Wars several years ago with... Um, What's that guy from 24 with the big head? Um, <laughs> Kiefer Sutherland, you know. Uh, it's a great, great movie, and it's based on the story of Ernest Gordon. And uh, I want to kind of read a couple excerpts from Philip Yancey's retelling of this story. Um, and, uh, and it gives us this incredible vision of, I think, what this might look like for the church of Jesus to see ourselves as participants in the ministry of reconciliation in a world where there is no sacred and secular, but it's all being redeemed. He says, Gordon was sent to work on the Burman Siam railway line that the Japanese were constructing through the dense Thai jungle for possible use in invasion in India. That doesn't make sense. Oh, yeah, there we go. For labor, they conscripted prisoners of war that they had captured from occupied countries in Asia and from the British Army itself. Against international law, the Japanese forced even officers to work at manual labor. And each day, Gordon would work a detail of thousands of prisoners who hacked their way through the jungle and built up a track bed through low-lying swampland. The scene was straight out of Dante. Naked, except for loincloths, these men worked under a broiling sun in 120 degree heat. Their bodies stung by insects, their bare feet cut and bruised by sharp stones. Death was commonplace. If a prisoner appeared to be lagging, a Japanese guard would beat him to death, bayonet him or decapitate him in full view of other prisoners. Many more men simply dropped dead from exhaustion, malnutrition, and disease. Under these severe conditions, with such inadequate care for prisoners, 80,000 men ultimately died building the railway. 393 fatalities for every mile of track. Okay, throw this picture up, Gretchen. We can get a picture of what's happening in this prison camp. But something was astir in the prison camp, something that Gordon would call miracle on the river Kauai. For, the, for most of the war, the prison camp had been a laboratory of survival of the fittest, every man for himself. In the food line, prisoners fought over the few scraps of vegetables or grains or rice floating in the greasy broth. Officers refused to share any of their special rations. Theft was common in the barracks. Men lived like animals, and hate was the main motivation to stay alive. 
Recently, though, a change had come. One event in particular shook the prisoners. Japanese guards carefully counted tools at the end of a day's work, and one day the guard shouted that a shovel was missing. He walked up and down the ranks demanding to know who had stolen it. When no one confessed, he screamed, All die! All die! And he raised his rifle to fire at the first man in the line. At that instant, an an enlisted man stepped forward, stood at attention and said, I did it. The guard fell on him in a fury, kicking and beating the prisoner, who despite the blow still managed to stand at attention. Enraged, the guard lifted his weapon high in the air and brought the rifle butt down on the soldier's, soldier's skull. The man sank into a heap to the ground, but the guard continued kicking his motionless body. When the assault finally stopped, the other prisoners picked up their comrade's corpse and marched back to the camp. That evening, when tools were inventoried again, the work crew discovered a mistake had been made. No shovel was missing. One of the prisoners remembered the verse, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Attitudes in the camp began to shift. Prisoners started treating the dying with respect, organizing proper funerals and burials, marking each man's grave with a cross. With no prompting, prisoners began looking out for each other rather than themselves. Thefts grew increasingly rare. Gordon sensed the change in a very personal way as two fellow Scots volunteered to come every day and care for him. The new spirit continued to spread through the camp. And this is what Gordon writes. Death was still with us, no doubt about that. But we were slowly being freed from its destructive grip. We were seeing for ourselves the sharp contrast between the forces that made for life and those that made for death. Selfishness, hatred, envy, jealousy, greed, self-indulgence, laziness, and pride were all anti-life. Love, heroism, self-sacrifice, sympathy, mercy, integrity, and creative faith, on the other hand, were the essence of life turning mere existence into living in its truest sense. These were the gifts of God to men. True, there was hatred, but there was also love. There was death, but there was also life. God had not left us. He was with us, calling us to the life, the divine life in fellowship. The story goes on. By default, Gordon became the unofficial camp chaplain. It's pris- the prisoners built a tiny church, and each evening they gathered to say prayers for those with the greatest needs. The informal discussion group proved so popular that a jungle university began to form. Whoever had expertise in a certain field would teach a course to other students. The university soon offered courses in history, philosophy, economics, mathematics, natural scientists, sciences, in at least nine languages, including Latin, Greek, Russian, and Sanskrit. Professors wrote their own textbooks as they went along, or in whatever scraps of paper they could find. Prisoners with an artistic talent salvaged bits of charcoal from cooking fires, pounded rocks to make their own paints, and managed to produce enough artwork to mount an exhibition. Two botanists oversaw a garden specializing in medicinal plants. Not that kind, Ben. A few prisoners had smuggled in string instruments. Other musicians carved woodwind out of, woodwinds out of bamboo, and before long, an orchestra formed. One man, blessed with a photographic memory, could write out the complete scores of symphonies from composers like Beethoven and Schubert. And soon, the camp was staging orchestra concerts, ballets, and mu- musical theater performances. What an incredible story of these guys living in literally what we might imagine as hell on earth. And they begin through this one act of courageous love to catch a vision for life and for flourishing even in the midst of a very broken and hopeless situation. If you know the story, Ernest Gordon goes on becoming the dean of the chapel at Princeton University and has this incredible impact 
for years and years. He died in 2002. Um, but multiple books, multiple movies now told about this story. And the way Yancey puts it is like this. That perhaps something like this was what Jesus had in mind as he turned again and again to his favorite topic, the kingdom of God. In the soil of this violent, disordered world, an alternate community may take root. It lives in hope of a day of liberation. And in the meantime, it aligns itself with another world, not just spreading rumors, but planting settlements in advance of that coming reign. Um, I don't know of a more beautiful story of what the church could and ought to be. Of each one of us seeing ourselves not just as people who attend a service or even are members of a congregation or a community, as central as that is, but seeing ourselves as commissioned, seeing ourselves as those that have a part to play, that our life has a song that it's meant to sing. And it may not fall into those traditional categories of pastor or evangelist or worship leader or minister, but it looks like a botanist and it looks like a songwriter and it looks like a physical therapist and it looks <clears throat> like a lawyer all going, what part do I get to play in announcing the coming reign of Christ that has already broken in? How does my work, how does my life, how does my vocation and my calling connect to the, the creation and the redemption story? And it's really not that big of a stretch if you think about it. That all human work, everything that we are doing, everything that God's gifted us to do and called us to do, actually connects to this grand narrative in ways that are right in front of us. For those of you that work in the field of medicine, of healing, do you realize that you live here in Bend as citizens of heaven, of a place where there is no more sickness, there is no more death? And when you're able to bring about healing from pain, <clears throat> from sickness. That is a taste of God's new world that's breaking in. And you're just doing your job, giving shots or adjusting backs or whatever you do. It's beautiful. For those of you that are in the world of education, you know that the invitation of Jesus is to learn to love God with our whole mind. right? That to learn to think and to learn to reason and to learn <clears throat> to inhabit this world as those that are paying attention. And as you educate the hearts and minds in front of you, you're participating in that mission. I could go on and on and on, especially for those of you that are in what we might call the creative spaces, right? the artists and the filmmakers and the poets and the songwriters, the designers. You are bearing the image of your creator. And I plead with you, Please don't make Christian art. Make good art. <laughs> God doesn't need you to put a Jesus fish or a Bible verse on your painting to make it Christian, right? We bear the image of the Creator when we make excellent things, when we tell true stories. Um, I could soapbox on that. Maybe I will sometime. All that to say... <clears throat> the foundation of this vision is that Christ himself has not given up on us and he has not given up on this world. That this world that he's created is the very same world that he has come to redeem and to reconcile. And so this is an invitation for this next journey, for this next season as Antioch, not just to be regular church attenders, but to actually be those that would buy in to this mission those that would be willing to take responsibility in stewarding this vision, in seeing that it's not just the church that I go to has this mission. It's like when you go to Red Robin and see the core values on the wall. It's like they're not expecting you to buy into that. That's not how this works either, right? This is our vision. This is our mission that Christ has entrusted to us and invited us by his grace to be part of his very life and part of his work in the world. And so this morning I want to invite you to come to the table to receive life again. 
And what I love is that this is not, this is the most spiritual and sacred thing that Jesus has given us, and it's entirely physical. It's a loaf of bread and a bowl of wine. Earthly, physical things by which Christ gives himself to us and invites us to meet with him. Will you stand with me? Lord Christ, we worship you. We surrender to you. We celebrate you this morning as the king, the creator, the redeemer, and the savior of all. We thank you that that salvation somehow is reaching even to us, that you are raising the dead in us. You are restoring what's broken in us. You are healing us, and you are forgiving us as we speak. And you are also calling and inviting and empowering us by your spirit to inhabit this world as those who bear witness to this coming kingdom where heaven and earth are one, where sacred and secular are no more, but all of life is under the lordship of Jesus. So we declare that we want this gathering, this place to be in this church to be one place in all creation where the lordship of Christ goes unopposed, where we surrender all of ourselves to you and bring all of this world before you with hope and with prayer. You and you alone are the one that we need and the one that this world needs. In Jesus' name.